<laughs> All right, we're going to try to finish off this facts about uh, Psalms, and we're going to uh, just mention uh, we're going to act as if we closed off with the son, with the sons of Asaph. We're going to talk about the Psalms of Jeduthun. And uh, supposedly these are Psalms 39, 62, and 77. <clears throat> um, and this guy is also mentioned just like Asaph and um, Heman in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 16, and a lot of the same scriptures that these other guys were. And uh, in Nehemiah, he's mentioned as a temple musician and a singer in the time of David. That's what it says. So... Most of these guys were operating in the time of David. Uh, he had descendants that functioned in the same way. He's connected to Ethan in, in uh, two different scriptures, 1 Chronicles 15, 17, and uh, 1 Kings 4, 31. All right, that was that one. Okay, we're, we're going to end this little thing pretty quickly. Psalms of Ethan the Ezra, Ezraite. Uh, and uh, he's the one... Maybe I did mention this. He's the one who wrote Psalms 89. And um, he also was a temple musician, singer in the time of David, and was a, as a wise man in the time of Solomon. I thought it was funny that Solomon would have wise men since he was the wisest man on earth. It just seemed strange to me. But, <clears throat> um, however... 1 Chronicles 2.6 says Ethan and Heman and others in 1 Kings 4.3 appeared as the son of Zerah, the grandson of Judah and Tamar, long before David and Solomon. Um, the Psalm of Heman the Ezraite is Psalm 88. And basically, he appears exactly in the same places as the other ones do, so the, those scriptures. So finally, the Psalm of uh, Solomon and most people think it was uh, Psalm 72 and Psalm 127. And then finally the Psalm of Moses, uh, which is Psalm 90. And I will say this, um, there, there are at least three different songs of Moses. And you may not be aware of that. You might... You know, some people say the song of Moses and they automatically think of, uh, I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider, which is in um, Exodus, <clears throat> um, which he did write. But there's also in other places that he wrote songs, including uh, Psalm 90. All right, so we're, that's it. That's all of the facts and stuff, and as I said, we're going to go ahead and get into Psalm 1. So turn there with me. <clears throat> While you're turning, I'll say this. My plan was actually to get into some themes before we got into particular psalms, but there's one particular theme that I was going to get into pretty quick that I don't want to break up because I, I'm not sure what my schedule is. When are we leaving for Ireland? So I have this Thursday and then next Thursday, right? <clears throat> okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure I didn't break it up, and it could take two or three times. I'm not sure. So we're going to go ahead and get into Psalm 1. Six verses. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Anybody notice anything that I just read right there in relationship to... Watchman knee. Sit, walk, stand. That's exactly right. It's the reverse. This is what Watchman knee writes from Ephesians, where it is about the what is it? First three verses, three chapters are about sit. The next two are about walk, and the last one's about stand. <clears throat> well, this one is about where you don't sit, where you don't walk, and where you don't stand, <clears throat> and. Uh, I'll read a little of this because there is, a, there is something that caught my eye about this. Um, walk not, nor stand, nor sit. Um, let's see. He finds no place 
for scoffing. He said, let, let others mock because he's learned better. The seat of the scorner may be lofty. It may be a high place where you look down on people, but <laughs> I wrote, it's not very far from the gates of hell. <clears throat> um, there are positive aspects and precepts in the Bible. Uh, love your neighbor. Uh, things like that. This is telling you that if you did all of those right, it wouldn't be enough. That there are some things you shouldn't, that not that you should do, but you should not do. And that, you know, I've heard that taught before under the theme of sins of omission. Anybody ever heard that before? <clears throat> you know, never made much sense to me before, except for now it does. You're omitting something. You're leaving something out. It's not just that you're, if you, if, if you did everything right and you left something out. And, um, and I remember the, one of the judgments that Jesus was talking about. And uh, he said uh, the difference between the sheep and the goats was, he said to the goats, um, you didn't feed me. You didn't take care of me. You didn't, you know. There were things that you were leaving out. And they may have been thinking, but I did this and I did that. And you get that from uh, when Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful work? Have we not done this? Have we not done that? Right? I mean, I, I did. I, I witnessed. I tithed. You know, I did all the right things. And he'll say, yeah, but you didn't. You know, there were certain things that you didn't do that you left out that were important. And these are some of those things that he says, blessed is the man that does not do. Not blessed is the man who does, but blessed is the man who does not do certain things. Uh, so I'll just read this paragraph. Positive precepts might not be sufficient. For he might walk in the counsel of the godly, he might walk in the counsel of the godly and yet walk in the counsel of the ungodly too. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's, po it's possible that we seek out godly people to talk to. It's also possibly possible that ungodly people seek us out. And when you say ungodly, you have to understand that Israel was a very closed nation. It's not like they hung out with, with sinners and ungodly. You know what I mean? They're talking about their people. They're talking about people that, um, that here's, here's a thought that came to my mind. <clears throat> An ungodly person would, would not put God in everything. You see what I'm saying? They wouldn't put God in everything. It'd be like somebody, and the, no, this is random, but it'd be like somebody saying, you know, this, what is the deal with, with these people around here? All they do is talk about the Bible. All they do is talk about Jesus. You know, and of course, it's like, well, I think you would do that in a Bible school. I mean, it's just a thought. I mean, I would think that would be what you would be there for, you know, you know that, that that would sort of be okay. But somebody, oh, no. No, we shouldn't be just talking about Jesus all the time. I'm sorry, as long as there's a Bible school, you're going to talk about the Bible. <laughs> you know, and you're going to talk about God. And you're going to do that first because you've got three years to do that here. And after that, you can be as ungodly as you want. <laughs> all right? Um, so... Uh, he is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He takes wiser counsel. And that's the word of God because the contrast is, but, and this is verse 2 and I'm jumping ahead, but let me just say, the contrast is, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Okay. So what is it saying? It is saying there is a counsel that is not the word of God. Now, it may not be the devil. It may not, it, it may not, push you toward rank sin. It may just push you towards 
not getting in the word, not putting the Lord first, not going after the Lord uh, with all your heart. Or, as we said, uh, s- listening to godly people and listening to ungodly people. Well, that's called mixture. And, and let me just, anybody, has anybody ever been in confusion before? Okay. Let me tell you what confusion is. Confusion is listening to two or more voices, sometimes in your own head. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that is where confusion comes. Let me tell you, there is no confusion when you got one voice. You know, the example I always use is, uh, this is old, outdated material, but when my wife and I first started having kids, you know, she was the youngest, so she didn't really know anything about it. And so it was like, what do I, you know, what do we do? How do we, you know, what schedule we put them on? How do we do this? How do we do that? And everything. So every time we'd go in a used bookstore or something, she'd pick up another book. And so there was Dr. Spock and this person and that person and that person and that person. And after a while, I came home and she said, I don't even know what to do. This one says you should do the baby, you know, wake the baby up every time you it's feeding. This one says you should do this. This one says you should do that. This one's contradicting that. What do I do? And she was like freaked out. And she had like four books sitting there. And I picked up three of them and walked over and I threw them in the trash. And I said, do what that one says. <laughs> but that takes care of the confusion. You know? Now you know why my kids turned out so bad. (laughs) It was uh, Dr. Spock. Not to be confused with Mr. Spock. (laughs) Two different people, okay. (laughs) Yeah, see, look, she's she's live long and prosper back there. She's a Vulcan. All right, so uh, he takes wiser counsel. <clears throat> My thought is, you, you're, you're, say you're, listen, you're sitting in a class and you're listening to the word of God, and then later you have a break or, you know, it's, and somebody comes up, sits beside you, and they start talking stuff that is not the Lord. It may sound good, it may not sound bad, but it is not godly counsel. Um, does anybody know the difference between godly counsel and good counsel? You know, just add something. I know, and it's good now. It's no longer God. Well, good counsel comes off the wrong tree. It comes off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, you can spend your whole life avoiding evil and, and listening to good. Folks, you need to listen to God. And this, this word needs to be God speaking to you. Really, it needs to be God speaking to you. And if it's not God speaking to you, what's going to happen is it's just another book. You know, the story of Abraham could be no different than the story of Abraham Lincoln. It's just some historical, excuse me, thing that you've learned, and it has no impact. And I've, I've been given a lot of thought to that personally, um, just even for my own life where, the, 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 you know, it says that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I don't want to get to the place where it's not powerful in my life, where it's not sharp, where you just listen and you go, okay, you know. And uh, uh, Today, the Lord shared two different things with me that I may be sharing when I'm in Ireland. Uh, because I realized that I'm, I might be sharing a lot in different times and places. And was wondering what was, you know, what was going to happen. <clears throat> and uh, the Lord shared with me today, and there are two sets of scriptures that everybody has heard over and over and over. But I saw the Lord afresh there. It's alive, you know. <laughs> the word of God's alive. It's, it's, it's fresh. It's new. And, and the whole point of my heart is, Doggone it. I want it to impact me. I don't want to be a hearer. 
I don't want to be numb. I don't want to be passive. What's the difference between passivity and waiting on the Lord? There's an action to it. Yeah, wait, I'm sorry. Good point. Good point. And I think the real heart of it is, is that true waiting on the Lord has faith. It's got faith. It's got expectation. Expectation. You know, it's like the other one just says, well, the Lord will do something when he gets ready. You know, let me tell you, get alive. Shake yourself. Wake up. You know, arise. Shine, for your light has come. Yes. Believe it. Yes, there is. You know? And the glory of it, says, he doesn't say arise, shine, come on, get it together. He says your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen on you. you. Say, I don't see it, I don't feel it. You're not supposed to see it or feel it. You're supposed to believe it in the word of God. And, and there, if you believe it, it will begin to manifest in you. But faith has uh, a living thing with it. It's, it's just it, that expectation says, I know yes. this thing's going to happen. Yes. I know it is. And you hold on. You hold on no matter what things look like. <clears throat> and that's the difference between somebody with faith and somebody just, you know, bounced around. They are at the mercy of every trial that comes along. And I don't want to be at the mercy of every trial. You know? I want to be in tune with the Lord. I want to believe that all things actually work together for good. I mean, come on. Let's think about that scripture. All things work together for good to them who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. And what does it say that that purpose is? that we may be conformed to the image of his son. If your goal is to be conformed to Christ, then all of it's going to work together. The only time you have to worry about circumstances is when you have no intention of being conformed to the image of Christ. Right? Right? Now, you know, we're talking about the counsel of the ungodly. We're talking about the counsel of the godly, of the godly, which is the light and the law of the Lord. There's your dividing right there. Who's saying, my God, you know, I can't believe it. You know, this person said this to me, and I just, you know, I can't stand it, and I can't stand them. And, you know, when you, you know. When your heart is overwhelmed, move to the rock that is higher than you. <laughs> well, what is that rock? That rock says, I am being conformed to the image of Christ. God is working on stuff in me. God, if nothing else, he's showing you that you're a flake. I mean, he's got to start that. Folks, Romans 7 is before Romans 8. Can I get amen on that? Romans 7 shows you that you're a wretched man by yourself. Romans 8 shows you what you are in union, in union, in Christ. No, therefore, there is no more condemnation in union with Christ. I just saw a glorious thing today. I did. Just something that I've wondered about for years in relationship to the tabernacle. And the Holy Spirit just kind of walked up and said, I want to share something with you. Just as sweet and powerful and mind-blowing as it could ever be. You just go, oh my God, we're all idiots. And we are. We, we are. We don't focus on that because that's Romans 7. We focus on what we are in union with Christ. Amen? Who you are in union with Christ. Not who you are. You know. This is not on the basis of you. This is on the basis of the one that you are in. Okay? The one, we'll just make this a vine, and this is a branch, that you are in with his life running through here and running into you. All provision that comes not from heaven, 
but from union. I can't express it more, and I, I pretty much only talk about this. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, when I, again, when I preached in, in uh, Wisconsin this past weekend, somebody said, you only know one message. <laughs> I've learned to preach it 970 million different ways. But it is this reality that will make a difference. You talk about impact and you talk about power to change. You talk about hope for idiots. Amen. Amen. Or whatever. It doesn't matter if you're an idiot or you're, it doesn't matter. It, it's hope for the wise. It's hope for the worst of the worst people. If, if we could figure out who was the worst person in this room, this would remedy it just like it would for anybody else. Isn't that right? But if you stay you, if you stay you or you try to get hold of this by you, you are in trouble. You are hopeless because, why? You're not the vine. You're the branch. You're too busy trying to act like the vine and to bring forth something that you can't. God put Romans 7 first because you would never cling or abide. Cling or abide. You would never cling unless you knew how wretched you were. See? Anytime you see your failures, anytime you mess up, anytime you get afraid, anytime you go into doubt, anytime you're all, you know, you know, just all over the place, come back to the rock, come back to the vine, come back to the rock. And that's... That's what, the, that's what the Word of God, that's why you delight in the Word. You don't go, oh, I love this commandment, thou shalt not steal. You think David meant that when he said, I delight in the law of God? I just love that commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I love that. <laughs> you know, you think? No, I think he understood that this thing was talking about, and David of all people seemed to, <laughs> understand that he's in union with the Lord and this thing comes as a result of, of that union. But there takes a faith. There takes a stand with the Lord here. And so if somebody else comes up and they start talking about, you know, all the, all the problems, all this and that that you have, don't listen to them. Let me give you a little hint that I have given 20 years of Bible school students. This is going to be profound. Write it down. Don't ever forget it. Don't listen to the devil. <laughs> okay, is that good advice? Huh? Don't listen. To, I have people come to me all the time. Oh, Brother Randy, would you pray for me? The devil said, I, I stop him right, what? The devil said, that's enough right there to go, don't. Let, you ever hear me say that? Yeah, you say, don't listen to the devil. But the devil said this. <laughs> don't listen to the devil. The devil was picking on me. The devil was saying stuff. The devil was saying I'm hopeless. No. He's hopeless because he can never come into union with Christ. Amen. There's hope for anybody Amen. that can come into union with Christ. There, it opens all doors. There are no limitations. I'm, I'm honest with you. There are no limitations. We only make the limitations in this little small room called the noggin. <laughs> in here, it's all very small and very tight and very, you know, oh, you know. And it's even more crowded when you let extra things in there. <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's like a one-room thing and you've turned it into a hotel. 
<laughs> you know, don't listen to the devil. And my other advice is, when the devil knocks on the door, don't answer. You know, the example I gave from the first year was, you open that door, the devil, that door's going to come open, and he throws a bag of snakes in there, and they just start going everywhere. And they fill the house, and it takes days, weeks, months, years to hunt down every one of them. Best thing to do, don't open it. Well, the devil said this, or I, I was just thinking about, you probably weren't thinking. The devil probably got thoughts in your head. You know what I'm saying? Meditate on the word of God day and night. That's what you meditate. That's what you think. Let this mind be in you. That's the mind of Christ. Don't, don't try to get the thoughts of Christ. It doesn't say let these thoughts be in you. It says let this mind be in you. You'll never get all the thoughts in there. You have to change minds. Do you know that? Repentance, folks, isn't that you stop sinning. Repentance is you change minds. You decide, you know what? I'm tired of this. Anybody ever get tired of the enemy? Anybody ever get tired of the carnal mind? Anybody ever get tired of the flesh? You say, I'm tired of this, and I know how to defeat it. I am crucified. I am raised up in the vine. And I'm going to start believing it. And when somebody, when the devil says something to me, I'm going to say, you know what? You need to take that up with my lawyer, Jesus. He's my paraclete. I forget what, that's the Greek word. He's my attorney. You need to take that up with my attorney. Yeah. But we don't. See, if they ever took you down to the courthouse and tried to pin a murder on you, first thing you'd do is say, I need to talk to my lawyer. That's the first, you would not open your mouth. But most of us forget that Jesus is an attorney, stands on our behalf, stands in between to make sure we get to God, stands there on your behalf, and we never call for him. We just sit there and let the enemy interrogate us until we break down in tears and go, I did it, I did it. <laughs> I did it. I'm sorry. Don't kill me. I deserve to die. <laughs> what you ought to say is, you're right, interrogator. I deserve to die. And guess what? I did die. I did. I'm crucified. I am crucified with Christ. It, the score has been settled. It's all taken care of. And now I am one with Christ. Says all this stuff about you. And you know, we just sit there and meditate on it. We, you know, they're right. What so and so said about me is true. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is, this, it seemed to work. For David, you know, it seemed to work for Paul. And, and I'm just going to tell you this. I have, you know, I've always had a poor self-image. Raised in an orphanage, you know, thing after thing after thing. I've had every reason for the enemy to defeat me, to beat me, to, and he has done it. And there is no, there was a time, I don't know that it happens as much anymore, there was a time, any time I got in front of a mirror, junk started going off, you're nothing, you're worthless, you're this and that. Every time. You're stupid, you're this, you're that. And, you know, it was, it was tearing me up for years. And there came a time, there came a time that finally I'd just stand there and he said, you're stupid. And I said, yeah, I know. No, but that's me and myself. I have the mind of Christ. I have oneness with Christ. I have the nature of Christ. If you don't stand up, what is it? You don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. 
<laughs> you know? You got to stand for something. And I'm going to tell you something right now. That's one reason why this place exists. So some people on the planet, not a whole lot apparently, but some people can make a stand. Because you try it out there, you know. It's like, it's like being tied to the mast of a ship in the hurricane, trying to live for God and everything out there, and it just swishes, swishes your way. And, you know, that's, I mean, this is just a thought. But that's, that, you know, it just came to me as I was looking at this guy tied to this mast and all this stuff. We, we are amazing. You know, the devil, just in this town, but I mean all over the world, there's horrible stuff going on. The enemy is doing terrible things, horrible things. Do you know that? Do you know what? People are suffering. Uh, there is wrong all over the world, and yet some people go to church not to pick on the devil, but to pick on God's people. <laughs> I mean, does that even make sense? I mean, really, when you think about it, it's like, well, let's marshal our forces and stand against the enemy that's so bad out there. No, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to loose people on the church and let them pick at, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. These seven things are wrong with you, are wrong with us. But compare that to the devil and what he's just doing right down the block here. I mean, you think about that, and you, I mean, I have, you know, there's, there's a, a fair smattering of ex-druggies in here. <laughs> I have seen some bad stuff in my day. I have seen paranoia reach heights that would just, that, that people live like animals for fear that they were going to get busted as they were dealing. <laughs> See, that was the key, they were dealing. So they were, I have seen, I have seen just really bad things done to people. Uh, my parents were alcoholics. I have seen my own mother beat and bloody. I've seen my brothers beat and bloody. I've seen horrible things. Well, that's, did you know that's, that kind of stuff's probably going on just within a stone's throw of this place? Right yeah, right now. And yet we're going, well, we're, you know, let them go. Let's not use our energy to pray against the devil. Let's stand against the church. I mean, does that even make sense? It doesn't. My God, there's, you know, if, if, if we think perfection is going to do the thing here, it's not. There, and you know what? There's probably not a lot that you can do to fix the church or the Bible school. Did you know that? Because if you did fix it, it'd probably be us. I think God just likes messing with us. Really. You know why? Here's why. I have seen this over and over and over, and I, I bet you guys have too, and you guys have too. I have seen this, and this honest truth, so you're going to have to take my word for this. I have seen this so many times, it blows my mind. The thing that would be driving somebody crazy, there's usually one big, this thing is just da-da-da-da, and just drive them crazy, and they're, they're griping, they're complaining, they're murmuring, they're trying to, destroy everything because this is what's wrong and I don't like this. And as soon as they left, God fixed it. How many have seen that, honestly? I've seen that over and over and over. I mean, so many times that it's almost like a law. It's like, I really want, here's what I want, Lord. Send me something that really, that really gripes, murmurs, and complains, and then send them away. Because something will get fixed. <laughs> You know, I'm not wanting them gone. I just want the, the, I mean, I'd like it all to be Christ too in every way. But the only way it seems to really work consistently <laughs> is what I just described. I'm, a, I'm not kidding. I'm blown away by it. I've seen it so many times that I don't even know, you know, how to think of it. Other, other than either God just likes messing with us or when we all stand before him, he's going he's gonna to be able to deal with people and say, why did you... You know, you sat there and did that, and then you left on your own. Yeah, right. You didn't pray. You didn't believe. You just grabbed. You know? And uh, guess what? I changed it right after you left. And you're still griping about it as if it's there. 
to people out there. Oh, well, that church, they've got this. No, no, they didn't. The day you left, I fixed it. <laughs> so you guys remember that if you're going to raise up a church or something. That's how to fix your church. <laughs> oh, that's the next class. Sorry. I'm like a madras shirt. I bleed into every part. <clears throat> Sorry, some of you don't know what a madras shirt is, do you? <clears throat> okay, uh, maybe I should uh, like read or something here. Um, he takes wiser counsel, the word of God. His walk is ordered by the word of God because he says, blessed is he who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. This means that his, his, uh, his walk is ordered by the word of God and not by the mind of carnal men. It is a sign of growth when the outward walk is changed both in positive and negative ways. In other words, that walketh not. That's a negative way, but it's changed. I won't walk in this. Not just I will walk in the Lord, I won't walk in this. <clears throat> the ungodly man has his counsel. The sinner has his way. The scorner has his seat. The ungodly man counsels and advises those with whom he converses to adopt his counsel. It is direction, but is not founded on Christ. Now, in some, in some ways, I mean, you know, every bit of this is really based on the individual's desire after the Lord. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, you can teach that. But, like I said, the ungodly man counsels and advises. And you say, I am not taking your counsel. Why? I didn't say anything wrong. I'm not hearing the Lord. I'm just hearing facts. I'm just hearing things that are temporal. Because, you know, things that are temporal will pass away eventually. Everything that's temporal will pass away. The word of God will endure forever. You can't go wrong riding that horse. <laughs> Sorry, a little Texas colloquialism there. Um, Therefore, blessed is the man who walks not in this man's way of measuring the counsel, the way that he measures. The word counsel refers to who is your source of input. Don't have sources of input that aren't going to lift up Jesus. Don't have sources of input that aren't going to edify you or the body. Am I right or wrong? I mean, come on. Just be real. Does the word of God not say that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? I mean, the highest would be 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But I mean, you know, that these, all these things we bring are meant to edify the body, not tear the body down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that Christ may be lifted up, that Christ may be glorified. I always think stuff like this. Okay, somebody thinks... Randy's saying this because he's the head guy in the church and he's the head guy in the Bible school and he says stuff like this so that everything will run smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that it would. <laughs> 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 but I know better. I've been at this long enough. Usually if I say something... Like what I'm saying so far in this class, it gets worse. It gets worse. I don't say it for results because I don't really believe I'm going to get results. I say it because it's the truth. I say it because it's the truth. You say what you say to the people because it's the truth. And when you're saying it, you try to make sure that everything in your own heart, number one, that you're trying to do what you're asking pe other people to do. You, you're, you're trying to, what I always say, you're trying to preach what you've been practicing. <laughs> Not practice what you preach, preach what you've been practicing. 
And number two, that you are nevertheless open to God to do anything he wants to do in terms of changing and fixing things. Amen? That's not a, that's not a wall against change. <laughs> it's not an excuse. But it's still the right way because, because without it, we're just like a ship without an anchor. We're just tossed by everything that comes along. Anybody that says anything. Find something you believe in. The, and I believe that something is the word of God. A stand for the Lord. A belief in the Lord. And stand. And stand your whole life. And there's times that you stand firm. And then there's times that you're stalwart in that stand. And there's times you're just enduring. You're just hanging on. But he that endures to the end. You know. There's not, it's not all going to be powerful. It's not all going to be fun. It's not all going to be wonderful manifestations of the Lord but it can all be someone who has you know stood in the Lord be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might say my God that's the word of God you know if you keep getting in there you're going to find it all keeps pointing back to here and it's all a living reality whether there's circumstances going on right now, and there always will be, and there will be after I'm gone. In your life, wherever you end up going, you can be assured of that. You can be assured of that. There's always going to be something. Well, make that something Jesus. There's always going to be something Jesus. I'm standing for Jesus. I'm, I'm letting all the things that are going on around me drive my roots deeper into the Lord. You know, and after all, when Jesus shows, you know, John, here's John the Baptist message. When Jesus shows up, he's going to lay the axe to the root. See, our message is, oh, if Jesus shows up, you're going to get healed. Oh, if Jesus shows up, he's going to bless your life. Oh, if Jesus shows up, he's coming, and when he shows up, everything's going to be good. I got news for you. He ain't going to mess with your fruit. He's not going to mess with your deeds and your acts. He knows where all that came from. He's going to skip the fruit. He's going to skip the branches. He's going to skip the trunk, and he's going to go right on down to the fiber, fiber of the root system itself, and he's taking you out, baby. That's what it starts with. And then he fastens you in himself, and he says, we will be together forever. We will be one. And you will be filled with my life. Folks, you know, you can just you can just be a little bitty old vine over here, you know, and go, well, I'm just, you know, I don't have much. And it is okay. Just make sure the reason why you're just a, a slim little old thing isn't because you didn't say, I'm yours. Enlarge my borders. You know? Enlarge my borders, Lord. You know, if you, anybody ever heard of the prayer of Jabez? Yes. Well, you should hear the real meaning. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's powerful. Yes, sure Enlarge my borders. Bust out my sides that are holding you back. Yes. That's what it means, you know. And, and let, me, let me be a pillar. And here's all I mean by that. Because we go, oh, you, brother, you're a pillar in the house of God. You know, we, got, we, got, we always got to go off on some weird thing, you know, that isn't Jesus, you know, anti-Christ, pro-us. We would never call it anti-Christ. We call it pro-us, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, you know, oh, you know, it's, 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 it's Peter saying, oh, no, Lord Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross. No, no, not, no, no, not so, Lord. How does that work? How do you get away with not so Lord? That, you know, do you catch those things, you know, in the word of God? Do you, do you just go, something is wrong here, Peter? Well, here's Jesus' response. Get behind me, Satan, for thou savorest the things that be of men and not of God. Be a pillar. And all, again, all I mean is, Make a stand and don't be moved. Is that good enough? You know, make a stand and don't be moved. Make it your stand. Don't make it my stand. Don't base it on me. One of the things that I've always appreciated about my girls is they, that, you know, 
they all did find Jesus for themselves. That's important, and, and that's important for your kids, too, that they do that, that they don't follow mom and dad's God. I'm telling you, it's very, very important that they find the Lord for themselves. And here's why. Because when the storm comes, if it's not their God, and that's why, you know, it was the God of Abraham at first, wasn't it? But then he had to become the God of Abraham and Isaac. And then the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, he wasn't just the God of Abraham. Is is good enough for all of us. Mr. I've got my Abraham credit card. All, you know, we're all, you know, we're all covered because he's got the Lord. No, sir. No, 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 N-O, and no, no, no. <laughs> no. Get your heart there. Get everything lined up. Get set, you know. Fix your face like a flint to go where? Disneyland. No, Jesus said, my face is set as a flint to go to Jerusalem. And they said, when you go there, they're going to kill you. And he said, no, they're not. I am going to be a willing sacrifice. Difference, big difference. They grabbed me and they murdered me. Can you see Jesus sitting on the throne talking like we do? Come on. You know, Jesus sitting there, we go in there and he goes, can you believe it? I was trying to live for God. They wouldn't let me. They did this to me, and they did that, and it was bad. What, I mean, what would you do? Would you go, my God, shut up. Stop the whining. And then he'd go, Psh, and you'd be a grease spot. Not really. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <clears throat> but... You know, the, this reality of Christ and him crucified, folks, I just came from a place where there are people just, they can't get enough. There's one guy there that, I don't know if you know how much stuff I have on the web. He's listened to everything and he's read everything already. Wow. There's another guy. He, um, I'm just blessed, but here, here's his description. And I'm sorry, but we've only got a few minutes, so I might as well do this. Here's his description. He said, here's the Jordan River, and here's where the land is. And Israel came up, and they didn't enter in. They went around, they got ready to go by the Jordan River. <coughs> and he drew that picture for me, and he said, that's me at the Jordan River. I have not crossed in. I have not seen Jesus yet. My life has not changed. It's still me. It's still my ways. It's still my complaints. It's still my problems. It's still me trying to get hold of Jesus. And he said, I am not moving, and I'm not going to say I'm in until God says I'm in. And that means the revelation of Christ. Did you know what that, that's what that means, actually? It's actually when you're making a st and he's just, he's going to get Jesus. And he, he not only told me that once, he told me that three or four different times. And, and he just, when, when you're up there sharing, ben, and ben shared, and then I shared, and when you're up there sharing, he's just all smile. He's sitting on the front row. He's not like sitting in the back, you know, going, uh, he's like, you know. And, and I had probably, I probably had 10 people come up to me and say, man, brother, I've been listening to your CDs. And he said, it's good to put a face to the, to the voice. He said, man, the Lord's been feeding me. It's really been good. And, I, and as I walked away from some of them, I went, CDs? I don't want no CDs. You know? I mean, you know, I mean, some people, I, I thought, what is it? So I went to, to Tony. I said, Tony, are you taking stuff off the web, making CDs and passing them out? And he said, to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Matt Dixon did. And, and them up in Washington, 
And maybe you guys didn't know this, but for but several years now, Matt is no, you know, their church, as far as his affiliation as a minister, is no longer Baptist or whatever. He's been under new creation for several years. His license comes through us. He's he is part and parcel of who we are, what we believe, what we stand for. He's he said, I'd send him a minister card, and he said, God told me to, to join with y'all, and this was years ago, and he said, he, said, uh, he said, but I need to be under somebody that's going to point me to the cross. He said that to me. And I said, well, I don't have much to offer, but I'll do that. <laughs> you know, I'm not much, but I'll tell you what, I will faithfully point you to the cross. I said, is it okay that I do it when you don't like it? Well, some of you know Matt. What, what do you think his response was? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he just, yeah, you know. I heard somebody just before I left on this trip, they said, well, we don't have any outreaches around here. This right here is an outreach. We have a Bible school. We have more of an involvement in outreach than most churches. Plus all the churches we go to, and they're feeding, and they're, they're taking in. Well, what is the, and you know what? Those people are all going to be listening to this. Am I right or wrong? And what is it that I would want to leave with them since i only got two minutes left? What is it I would want to leave with them? I'd want to leave this with them. Make your stand. Make your stand for God. Make your stand for the message of Christ and him crucified. Get him in you. Get him established. You get established in the word first because that's what it takes. You have to. Right? You gotta get this word in you. you. Gotta just get the scriptures in you first. And then let the Spirit of God take it from being ink and white paper. Living word. I said that up in Wisconsin. I said some guy came up to me and said, What translation do you read? I said, King James. He said, Well, I read the I, I read the um, uh, Living Bible. And I said, Well, I I read the living word. <laughs> you know, I just want to feed. I want to feed. I don't want to read. I want to feed. I want to, uh, like what, the way it happened today, I want to feed and I want to taste of this bread of life, which is Christ. And I want to be transformed from glory to glory into that same image. And it's still happening and it's still going on. But I don't want to learn stuff. I want to be changed. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? I mean, you do learn stuff, but I, but I know too many people. It's like, you know, I'm trying to quit, okay? I really am. I know people, you know, if you said that there is this many people who have out of, you know, the whole chalkboard, this, you know, I'd see this kind of map, but this many people who have entered into the message of Christ and Him crucified, okay, out of everybody. I mean, you really just make the whole room or city of Denton that may be this small for those that have said, you know, the cross, Christ and Him crucified. But among those, a huge portion, I don't even know what portion, you know, a huge portion of those. Just go off into the knowledge of it and then just share and talk about it and all this kind of stuff. But there's never a transformation. I remember, and this is it, I'm trying to quit right now. But I remember this thing when, when, um, when I was reading once and it spoke of the word transformation. And I went, I mean, you know, you probably, if somebody had stood there, they could have pushed me over. I thought, my God. We can be transformed. I mean, just the word seems so incredibly powerful to me. Transformation. I went, I want to believe for that. You know, not just, well, praise God, yes, hallelujah. You know. You know. And, and I'll, I'll end it with this. The biggest enemy of better is good. The biggest enemy of best is better. When we're doing good, we don't normally seek for better. When we're doing better, we don't seek for the best. Let something get on the inside. I don't know how to tell you this. I mean, I don't. I don't. 
I wish I, if I could impart it, I would. But let something get on the inside of you that says, because when we're, when we're not doing good, we're all out for God. Amen. But when you're doing good, say, I, I got to have more. I got to have more. I must have more of Jesus. I, you know, and I, I did that in Bible school. I did. I did that in Bible school. I would go, I, you know, and I'd come up to, to, to there were different leaders in different places over stuff. And I'd say, please pray for me. I got to have more Jesus. I got to. And some of them would say, what, what's wrong with you? I mean, you know, are you in sin? Are you, I mean, you're so, you know, you're so passionate, there must be a real problem. I said, yeah, the real problem is I got to have Jesus. I got to have more. I'm not satisfied. I can't be satisfied with where I'm at. And don't ever do what I'm fixing to tell you here. This is one of those disclaimers. Don't try this at home. I told the Lord, if I ever get complacent, if I ever become an average Christian, make me go insane. I meant it. I meant it. Some of you looking at me like, so that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, huh? Okay. But I mean, I did, and I meant it, and you know, the good thing is, I really did mean it. So it's, there's been a stability of pressing and going and saying more, more Jesus, more Jesus. I must have more Jesus. I must know you more. I must conform more. You know, I've had people say, Randy, you, I've seen more Jesus in you than any other human on earth. Why are you always crying out for more Jesus? I said, because I must have more Jesus. <laughs> I can't live with anything left of me. <laughs> it's got to be all Jesus. So I don't want to get off in the knowledge area. Amen? Amen? Let it be life. Let it be life. All right, let's take a break, and we'll come back for the other, other class.